most of you know, uh, I come from a military family, moved around a lot, but the reason I'm here in Augusta is because of my wife, and the reason I'm talking about this subject is my wife's father. And many of you in the audience know the story, but it's worth telling. Jimmy Dias of Augusta, Georgia, is the only person in history to have earned America's two highest awards for heroism, the Carnegie Medal, which you see here, and the Medal of Honor. No one else has ever done that, and as a result of putting his book together, the book together on him, I've gotten involved in the Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation, and I'm going to tell you some stories of Medal of Honor recipients and stories of Carnegie Medal recipients. The Carnegie Medal is not very well known, even though it's been given out since 1904, and about 80 people are, are given the medal every year. So I want to tell you a couple of stories about the Carnegie Medal. Ten years ago, almost exactly, I had the great honor of being the banquet speaker in Pittsburgh, which was Andrew Carnegie's home, of the 100th anniversary of the Carnegie Medal. It was started in 1904, so now it's 2004. And the reason they asked me to be the banquet speaker was because of the Jimmy Dias story, the unique aspect of the Jimmy Dias story. In the audience of about 500, there were 26 recipients of this wonderful award for extraordinary civilian heroism. So I decided to talk to some of these folks. And my favorite story is a woman, age 83, named Kelly from Shreveport, Louisiana. She might have been five feet tall. She might have weighed 100 pounds. And two years prior to that, so at age 81, she'd climbed over a fence, dove into a lake, swam way out, and saved a woman who'd gone under three times. Saved her life. So I asked her, I said, now why did you do that? And she said, well, my husband was too old and feeble, he couldn't get over the fence. <laughs> At the time, she was the oldest recipient. I think there's one person that's even older. The youngest recipient of the Carnegie Medal was a seven-year-old girl who, in the middle of a big fire in her house, ran upstairs, grabbed her baby brother, threw him out into the bushes, and saved his life, but she lost her life in the process. So the youngest recipient of the Carnegie Medal was a posthumous recipient. 21% of the people who earn the Carnegie Medal earn it posthumously. But my most favorite story of the Carnegie Medal is the story of the 11-year-old boy. I want to get, put this picture together. A baby has fallen down through a small concrete opening 18 feet into an abandoned cesspool. The baby's down there, and no adult can get through the little opening. So the 11-year-old boy volunteers to go. He's really skinny, and so the firemen tie him by his feet, and they lower him all the way down to the little baby. Now, it's not a pleasant place to be. It's an abandoned cesspool. There are animals, and, I mean, not animals, but there's insects running around. He grabs the baby. They pick him up, pick him up, pick him up, and just before he, they get to the top, he drops the baby and back into the muck, bloop. And he comes up and he takes a couple of breaths and he says, I gotta go back. And so they give him a basket this time. They lower him, lower him, lower him down. He puts the baby in the basket, grabs the handle of the baskets, lift him up, lift him up, and lift him up, and he saves the baby. He earns the Carnegie Medal at age 11. Now recently at Stevens Creek Elementary School in Columbia County, I was speaking to about 150 kids, and they were, the, they were fifth graders. They're all sitting on the floor in the gymnasium. I told them that story, and then I asked them, how many of you all are 11 years old? Well, guess what? If you're in the fifth grade, chances are you're 11 years old. So most of them held up their hands. So I said, okay, put your hands down. Then I said, how many of you all would do what that boy did that day? And the hands started going up. So I looked at a little boy and I said, why would you do it? He said, well, I learned in Sunday school that we should look out for people, and I thought it would be the right thing to do. How about you, little girl? Oh, my mom would really be mad if I hadn't gone and saved that baby. <laughs> what about you, little boy? I think was, the little boy was maybe the most important one. He said, if I woke up the next morning and knew that that baby had died, I would feel really bad. And so we have within our children the basic proclivity for altruism and heroism and willing to do that, and we need to nurture this caring compassion that all of us have as we go forward in life. The next story I want to tell you is, is Medal of Honor stories. We're now in the Medal of Honor. The Medal of Honor is the highest award. I'm going to show you a, a video by Brian Williams, which will explain the medal, but I want to tell you a few Medal of Honor stories before I do that. 
The Medal of Honor story that I like the best is the story of Jack Jacobs. Jack Jacobs is five feet four. He weighs 116 pounds. He was very badly wounded in combat on the 9th of March, 1968. The top of his head was sliced off. Uh, he had a bunch of bones broken in his face. He had a piece of steel in one eye. He was bleeding pretty profusely. And yet in the next five hours, he pulled 25 wounded friendly soldiers off an active battlefield. Only 13 of them survived. So I sat him down here in Augusta a few years ago, put him in front of a camera, and I said, Jack, what went through your mind at the moment you were so badly wounded and yet your buddies were down all over? He said, well, I learned something in Hebrew school when I was a little boy. Of the 76 living recipients, that's all we have left, 76 living recipients, two of them are Jewish, and Jack is Jewish. I said, what did you learn in Hebrew school? He said, I learned a great quote from a very famous rabbinical scholar by the name of Hillel. And I said, what's the quote? And he said, well, it's not exact, but here it is. If not me, who? If not now, when? So I said to myself, if not me, who? Who's going to rescue these guys? He was the only one who could get around, so it had to be him. If not now, if not now when? He couldn't wait for a rescue team because the enemy was going onto the battlefield, shooting his wounded buddies and stealing their weapons. So he had to move forward. It's a wonderful coda or motto for any kind of a crisis situation. If not me, who? If the EMT person's there or the fireman's there, let them do it or you can help them. But if not, you may have to do it. If not now, when? If you can wait for that fire truck to arrive, fine. But if the car's on fire and there are kids in the back of the car, you may have to do something yourself. So to be ready for a crisis situation with that kind of a mindset, it seems to me, can be very, very powerful. Now, there's an aspect of Jack Jacobs' story that my wife doesn't like me to tell, but I'm going to tell it to you anyhow. He's now in the hospital. He's got a plate in his head with a lot of drains coming out here. And the doctor's coming down and doing his rounds. It's, it's like a mash. They don't call it a mash in Vietnam, but it's like a mash. And the doctor comes to his hospital bed and he looks into his face and he says, oh my gosh, Lieutenant, I've never seen anything like that. By the way, when you deal with doctors, you always want them to see something like that lots of times. I've never seen anything like that. Oh, Jack says, well, what is, what is, what is the, what's going on? He said, no, no, we got to take some pictures. So they took lots of pictures and Jack said, you got to tell me what's going on. And the doctor says, well, what's happening is your face is collapsing. You've got so many bones broken in your face that it's falling in on itself. And Jack said, well, that's not very good. And the doctor said, no, 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 I've read about it in the medical books. We can fix it. So he comes in with some surgical tubing, a long steel spike and a balloon and he runs the balloons up his sinuses. And Jack says, doctor, that really hurts. And the doctor said, wait a minute, wait till I blow up the balloons. So he blew up the balloons, held his face in place for about uh, 10 days, came out back later, pulled out the balloons and finally give Jack a mirror. Now Jack's looking at his face for the first time in two weeks. His head is still about the size of a pumpkin, but all the pieces are in place. And he says, doctor, he says, you've done a nice job. What kind of a surgeon are you? A neurosurgeon, a facial surgeon, a, a plastic surgeon? A ortho what kind of a surgeon are you? The doctor says, I'm not a surgeon. I got drafted six months ago. I'm a gynecologist. <laughs> true, true story. In the Army, they call that a field, experience. It's field expedient. You go with what you got. Jack has had 22 operations on his head. He has no sense of taste, no sense of smell, but he's going very, 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 very well. Okay, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to show a video of uh, Brian Williams. It runs about an, a minute and 50 seconds, and it gives you a little history of the Medal of Honor. And then I'll go on and talk about a couple of other things. The veteran broadcaster Paul Harvey is famous for saying there are two tangible symbols of sacrifice representing the ultimate offer of one's life for others. One of those symbols is the cross of Christ and the other is the Congressional Medal of Honor. It's likely that when he first uttered those words, the Medal of Honor was more widely recognized than it is today. But to those who have heard the stories of brave American service people who in the heat of combat performed astonishing acts of selflessness to aid their embattled comrades, that symbol shines as brightly and significantly as any other in American life. Signed into law by President Lincoln in 1861, the medal was first intended for Navy personnel, 
But soon after, a similar decoration was established for the Army. The medal was bestowed much more frequently in those days, but by the time an Air Force medal was established, a century later, the existence of other military decorations made the Medal of Honor our nation's highest and rarest military honor. Fewer than 3,500 Americans have ever been chosen to wear this hallowed emblem, many of them posthumously. But despite its rarity, the ideals it symbolizes are alive in each and every person who serves this nation in uniform. Namely, the capacity for courage, selflessness, and sacrifice that are the hallmarks of service. There can be no doubt, as we pause to take stock of our lives as Americans, we can find profound inspiration in these stories and perhaps recognize some of those prized characteristics in our civilian lives as well. Let me tell you a little bit about Brian Williams. He is on the board of the Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation. I'm the secretary and he comes to all our meetings. He was the one that got uh, the money from General Electric to get this character development program going. So if you have any doubt on which uh, news organization you ought to watch on every night, watch Brian Williams. I mean, he is really a good guy and he does a lot of, he's only on one board and that's the board of the Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation. But what happened was when he came up with the money from General Electric, we decided on the foundation side that we would put together a character development program to go into the middle schools and the high schools around America. And we are doing that and that's what these discs are all about. The idea is if we could begin to get young people to see role models besides the great sports stars and the Hollywood stars who sometimes go astray morally, if we could use Medal of Honor recipients and also civilians who've done great things. And in this program, there are great stories of civilian heroism and civilian community work as well as Medal of Honor stories. And we focus not just on heroism, not just on courage. We look on leadership and, and teamwork and citizenship and patriotism and all that business. So this is a program that's coming into the schools around here. You can be looking for it. I would encourage you to encourage your teachers and your principals to use it. It's a program you can use for a full semester, or you can use it for a summer program, or you can use it for a one day program, or you can use it for a one hour program. But the vignettes that they show of the Medal of Honor recipients are very, very powerful. Now, since I assume I have a little more time, let me tell you a couple more Medal of Honor stories. One is the story of John Finn. John Finn died recently at age 100. He was the last recipient, the la very last recipient from Pearl Harbor. When I was a little boy, I was on the way to Sunday school on that day, so I got, a wa got to watch the attack at age six. But he was in his 30s, and it's a very long story, but he earned the Medal of Honor that day. Now it's many years later at the New York Stock Exchange in New York. We're having this great fundraiser to raise money for the foundation. And, and, and this man now, John Finn, is now 98 years old, and he decides just on the moment he's going to make a speech. And he goes wandering, walking up to the podium saying, I'm going to make a speech. Well, he wasn't in the program. The program was very tight. We didn't want him to make a speech, but how do you stop a 98-year-old recipient <laughs> who wants to make a speech? So he gets up in front of this wonderful audience. At every table, there was a Medal of Honor recipient he gets up and says, ladies and gentlemen, I want everybody to know that I love America. And everybody applauds. I want everybody to know I love the U.S. Navy, because he was a Navy guy. Everybody applauds. I want everybody to know I love all my fellow recipients. Everybody applauds. He says, and I want everybody to know that I really love this place. And then he says, where are we? <laughs> and somebody says, John, we're at the New York Stock Exchange. He says, oh yeah, I want everybody to know I really love the U.S. Navy Stock Exchange. <laughs> Couldn't get the Navy out of his mind. <laughs> Unfortunately, we lost John. A couple of other stories. One is the story of Sammy Davis. Sammy Davis has visited here. He will come back again. By the way, we bring a Medal of Honor recipient here twice every year. One for the Boy Scout event in November and the other one for the Jimmy Dias uh, uh, Symposium, which takes place in January. But Sammy Davis has spoken to more than two million school kids in the last 40 years. He doesn't get paid for it, but he does it because he feels he has a message. And his basic message is never give up. He's got this message of persistence because in this particular battle, he was shot, he had 30 holes in his back, 
but he saved all the people. He's the real Forrest Gump. They stole that story for that part of the movie and we took all these people across the way. But his basic message is that. But what I like about most about Sammy is he takes his medal off and he gives it to the first child in the audience and asks them to pass it around. So more than two million children throughout America have held this iconic medal in their hand. And it's really, really inspirational. If I may tell one more story, and that's the story of Roger Donlan. Roger Donlan was the first recipient, living recipient from the Vietnam War. He speaks all over the country also and was speaking to a group of very small children, like seven-year-olds. And he's speaking to these kids. And before he goes in to speak, the teachers say, Roger, if you don't mind, when it's time for questions and answers, please let Robert, let Robert ask a question. So Roger makes this little short speech and says, let's have questions. And he says, Robert, are you in the audience? And Robert says, yes, I am, holds up his hand. What's your question? He says, may I, may I touch your medal? May I hold and look at your medal, feel your medal? Uh, it turns out that Robert was blind. So they brought Robert up and Roger Donlan got down on his knees and, and Roger explained the symbols on that particular medal, the, the Army Medal of Honor. And about that time, little Robert gave Roger a hug and the teachers were amazed because this child was not only blind, but he had been badly abused as a child. And for the first time in his life, he actually hugged an adult and he hugged the Medal of Honor recipient. So that's the impact that these guys have. We get them down here quite often and it's a wonderful pleasure for me to be involved in all that kind of stuff. <laughs>